All right, I think that we'll go ahead and uh, move forward to the final speaker of the session. I'd like to introduce uh, Muna Nash from University of Houston, who will be talking about developing non-viral nanoparticle gene delivery for retinal degeneration. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I would like uh, to thank the organizers for inviting me to present uh, today and the audience for staying to the end of this uh, session. Uh, before I start, I uh, wanted to um, acknowledge my current lab members at University of uh, Houston and past lab members who contributed to a lot of the work that I will be presenting today and my collaborators, um, Dr. al Obedi, who is my partner in life, and uh, Mark Cooper, Awesome Ziadi, and um, Gensham Agari, who they are, they helped me uh, quite a bit um, in the uh, development of uh, these nanoparticles and also the application, um, their applications in, in the eye. There are so many benefits um, in using the eye as a model system to test uh, new therapeutic uh, strategies. Um, these benefits include uh, the eye being an isolated system with minimum or no systemic uh, exposure um, for delivering of any therapeutic um, agents. And the other advantage um, in the eye, using the eye, is it has limited number of cells that um, it's a lot easier to deal with than using other um, organs. And they, the retina is easily access, uh, accessible, as we heard from the first uh, uh, talk, uh, through either subretinal injection or intravitreal injections. Both of them are routinely uh, done in the clinic. And um, the retina is immune uh, privilege, which makes it a lot easier to work with. And um, there are multiple hereditary diseases with different onsets of degeneration, which it gives us a good window of opportunity to attempt uh, 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 the, the, our uh, therapeutic uh, strategies. And um, the other advantage, there are many um, animal models of these hereditary, hereditary diseases that we can use for a preclinical uh, testing. And we have several uh, non-invasive methods to monitor um, the uh, treatment outcome. Besides all of these benefits, there are many disadvantages working with the, with the retina. All, most of the cells are non-dividing uh, cells, which is hard to transfect. And in order to get good outcome, therapeutic outcome, we have to have a wide distribution of the therapy. And um, level of expression is also important to get um, a good um, uh, correction to the phenotype. Uh, gene silencing and other problems we are encountering and everybody is encountering, which leads into transient uh, rescue. And um, other disadvantage is that once the onset of degeneration is set, then it's very uh, difficult to get a good uh, rescue. Um, we are working with this last challenge is that a lot of uh, retinal degeneration um, diseases are associated with large genes, which is also very difficult to use the current um, uh, methods of uh, delivery. And I'm going to show you today in my talk some of these challenges that we try to overcome with the strategy that we were uh, using. So the goal of our research uh, has been and will continue to develop an effective gene delivery system that can bypass the limitations that we're all familiar with, with the AAV or with the viral delivery and also with the non-viral delivery being non very um, uh, effective. Um, so we uh, adopted the strategy that has been used in the, um, in the uh, uh, lung and as well as in the brain. Uh, which is self-compacted DNA nanoparticle, and we worked in the last 15 or 16 years to enhance the efficacy of this uh, strategy for ocular gene delivery. And besides enhancing the efficacy of nanoparticle delivery, we also worked on vector engineering to improve on the quality of the vector we develop that will be compacted for ocular gene delivery, and I will show you some of the work that we have done in the last um, decade or so. 
Our attempts has been to rescue the retinal diseases that are associated with large genes, and, um, and also to make sure that the strategy that we are using are, uh, are non-toxic and leads not, uh, into no uh, side effect on the retina and the body. So the particles we are using is CK30 PEG that has been developed by Awesome Ziadi and Pamela Davis when both were at Case Western. And it's made of um, the, com the uh, combination of CK30 cation um, uh, complex with the RNA or DNA. And uh, the neutralizing agents they have used to um, to neutralize these particles, um, there are several ones they used, and it gives different shape of uh, nano of the particles. In the eye, we tested the acetate and the trifluoroacetate, and we found out that both of them give us really good expression, and the expression is varies from one cell type to another. But for the, for the most of the study, we uh, focused on the acetate because uh, it uh, transfected the photoreceptors and the RPE a lot better than trifluoroacetate. The um, formulation of these particles are quite easy, and it's very small in the size. Uh, it ranges from 8 to 20 nanometer based on the size of the vector. It's uh, highly stable. Uh, we were using particles um, after seven years been in the refrigerator. And it's nucleus resistance. And the shape of the particles, as I said, it depends on the type of the counter ions. The acetate gives rod shape, while the trifluoroacetate gives um, ellips ellipsoid uh, type of uh, um, particles. And we found that it has no limitations on the size of the vector. Um, in the uh, airway epithelial cells, it was used up to 20 kb in size. In the eye, we used it up, uh, up to 15 kb, and we are in the process of testing about 22 kb for Usher uh, model of Usher, uh, Usher type 2A. It can transfect uh, mitotic and post-mitotic uh, cells pretty well. And it has been well used for the lung, uh, specifically for cystic fibrosis in the brain and um, in, in the eye. We have shown that it can transfect RPE cells, which is retinal pigment epithelium, and the photoreceptor cells. And, um, and we showed appreciable improvement on, um, on, on uh, rescuing uh, uh, sites in several animal models of retina degeneration. And we also show no toxicity at all, even after multiple uh, dosing. We can modulate the level of expression based on the amount of nanoparticle we deliver. We found out with four microgram DNA in one microliter of nanoparticles give us very nice level of expression of GFP using CMV as, um, as a, a promoter. And this level of expression is comparable to about 88% of rhodopsin, uh, which is the highest expressing gene in, in, in the eye or probably in the entire body. And we can modulate the level of expression to, to as antigen or transducin by just changing the, the amount of DNA we deliver. And in most of the studies that I show you, we delivered it in the subretinal space because we found out that we get better expression in the photoreceptor and the retinal pigment epithelium would deliver when we deliver it in the subretinal space. And now we are working on deliver it, uh, delivering the particles in the vitreous and hoping to, to get it to, to these two uh, cell types with less invasive uh, method. Now here's an example of uh, two days post-injection of a nanoparticle that expressing uh, a promoter specific to retinal pigment epithelium um, and uh, express GFP. And here's a flat mount of the uh, retinal uh, pigment epithelium. Uh, two days post-injection, you could see um, expression, uh, wide expression throughout uh, the uh, cell layer, uh, while we don't see any expression from the saline injected eye. Um, if you, we looked at the, at the uh, uh, RPE whole mount uh, for, at the site of injection and far away from the site of injection, and we could see almost every single cell in there um, expressing GFP, and it decreases as you go far away from the injection site. When uh, we took a cross-section of some of the eyes that were um, injected and 
14 days post-injection, and we can see the expression is exclu exclusively in the retinal pigment epithelial cell layer here. So um, after long studies, we realized that these uh, nanoparticles are basically facilitating the transport of the DNA into the cell and into the nucleus, bypassing the lysosomal uh, machinery. And this is what Pamela Davis and her colleagues showed in the airway epithelial cells. So we, we did a very similar experiment in the retina using um, a VMD uh, GFP uh, expressing nanoparticle, which is specific to the retinal pigment epithelium. And here is an example of um, DNA that is labeled with rhodamine and um, compacted into acetate uh, nanoparticles and delivered into the subretinal space. And six months post-injection, we could see, still see the particles, some of the particles outside the cell. Here is a 3D uh, construction of two retinal pigment epithelial cells, and the nucleus is labeled with laminin. You can see some particles are still outside the cell in the cytoplasm and some inside the cells. So we realize that this is really very helpful to us is if we can get these particles into the nucleus, then inside the nucleus, we are dealing with the vector. And vector engineering is essential uh, for us uh, to construct the vector where it has all the regulatory elements that stays stable for the long period of time and high level of expression. And I'm gonna show you in the, my next slides is exactly what uh, we have attempted. So, oh, what do I do? Okay, here you go. So here is an example of uh, one study where we constructed uh, the vector to have um, SMAR sequence, with it, which is a scalpel matrix associated region, has been shown in a lot of studies to enhance level of expression and to keep the vector episomal. So we, we um, have this uh, sequence right immediately after the GFP at the th three prime region. And compared this vector with a vector that doesn't have um, this sequence, and it's, it's a regular vector we use in the lab, which is PUG, and injected in the subretinal space. And again, just to emphasize here, we used RPE a specific promoter. And we injected in the subretinal space, and we found out that after almost two and a half years post-subretinal injection, from the vector that lacking the SMAR, we could see a few cells still expressing GFP at the site of injection. While the one that injected with the vector that has SMAR, we could see wide distribution of um, the transfected uh, retinal pigment epithelial cells throughout uh, the, the eye. And the saline, you, you see no, uh, the saline injected eye, you see no uh, GFP expression. And a whole amount um, of these, uh, some of these eyes shows expression, higher level of expression with the SMAR um, containing vector in comparison to the one that lack in it. So uh, the next step, we have been asked uh, if we could um, evaluate the efficacy of these nanoparticles to the golden standard method of, um, of AAV delivery um, that has been used in a clinical trial. So we collaborated with Bill Houseworth, and we got two AAV vectors from him, one that expresses um, AAV2, uh, that expresses GFP from a chicken beta actin promoter, and the other one that expresses GFP from a photoreceptor specific promoter, which is the mouse opsin promoter. So we formulated these vectors into nanoparticles, and we got the virus uh, from him, and we did side by side experiment by injecting it in, in mice. These are wild type mice, and we looked for level of expression at different time. Here's a, a Western blot showing GFP expression from these two nanoparticles of um, these vectors and uh, from the comparable naked DNA. We see expression at two days post-injection. No expression was seen from both viruses, but the expression from these viruses start appearing at seven days post-injection, but we continue seeing it from the nanoparticle and the naked DNA. 
at two weeks post-injection from the naked DNA disappear as, um, as usual, but we continue seeing it from both nanoparticles and from the virus. The expression continue and pretty comparable to each other from the nanoparticles and the viruses at 30 days post-injection. Interestingly, at four months post-injection, we found out that the uh, nanoparticles that are directed by the photoreceptor-specific promoter continue expressing in the, in the eye and as well as from the virus. But the particles that is directed by the chick chicken beta actin stopped exp expressing while it continue with the AAV. So this alert us even further into the importance of vector engineering uh, to have a proper sequence in order for these nanoparticles to continue expression, uh, expressing the delivered, delivering gene for a longer period of time. So here's an example of cross-section of the nanoparticle at, uh, delivered uh, of the chicken beta actin GFP at two months post-injection showing uh, a wide expression throughout the retinal pigment epithelium and the photoreceptor cell layer. And here is from the AAV version of it. You could see um, higher, I could see a lot of more expression probably, but other thing we noticed is that with the nanoparticle, the expression is more local at the area of injection. While with the AAV, it goes between the cells and even reach into the ganglion cell layer. And uh, we looked at the brain of these animals that were injected. We found out no expression of GFP in the brain or from the nanoparticle delivered uh, eye, while we see expression in the brain or from the AAV delivered um, nanopart uh, 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 AAV delivered uh, chicken beta actin GFP. And here's an example also from the mouse opsin uh, 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 vector that expresses GFP as a nanoparticle. We do see very comparable uh, level of expression or distribution to that from the AAV. So we next um, did uh, a lot of studies where we looked at the toxicity and this, all of them have been published. We showed there's no toxic effect, no induction of immune response and also uh, a, a comparable recovery in terms of the functional uh, 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 function of the rods and cones post-injection in compar co comparable to that of saline injected eye. So we moved on into testing the efficacy of this strategy in animal model of retina degeneration. And we started working with a model that has been difficult to rescue at that time uh, due to the large size of the gene, and that is ABCA4. The cDNA itself is 6.8 kV, which was difficult to rescue it by the regular AAV vector. So ABCA4 is, um, is a uh, flippase, a photoreceptor-specific flippase that works on uh, flipping, a, a, a flipping um, all transretinal in ATP-dependent uh, manner uh, from the rim region of the disc outside to be recycled into the RPEs. Uh, and the absence of this uh, gene or this protein leads into the accumulation of all transretinal in the lumen that will get oxidized and uh, leads into the formation of A2E and uh, byproduct, and that cannot be digested by the retinal pigment epithelium, and that leads into uh, problems in the retina and degeneration of the photoreceptor cells and lack of vision. So there are over 500 disease-causing mutations in this gene and uh, that they found to lead either to star guard uh, macular dystrophy uh, Conrad dystrophy or retinitis pigmentosa. The ABCA for knockout mouse, uh, the phenotype in, in it mimicking very well the phenotype seen in patients. Um, you can see here uh, uh, ABCA4 located in the outer segment in this cross section of the wild type retina. This ABCA4 completely lack this uh, protein. One of the phenotypes you see in the ABCA4 knockout, similar to patient, is accumulation of lipid droplets in the retinal pigment epithelium that cannot be digested. 
and uh, what you can see it in comparison to the wild type. Another phenotype is seen is a delay in the dark adaptive uh, response, meaning that if the patient been exposed to light for a while, if he gets in a dark room, it takes him very, very long time, sometimes several days, to regain his vision. These mice have the same um, a problem. One of the mutations uh, was studied very well, which is the K969M. It was found to lead into inactive protein. So what we did is uh, generated two vectors. One is directed by um, one is directed by the mouse opsin promoter, and the other one is directed by the IRPB promoter. IRPB promoter expresses in rods and cones. Opsin promoter expresses only in rods. And we use these two vectors to express the wild type gene, which is the cDNA, versus the mutant version of uh, the, the, the cDNA as a control. And here's an example at, uh, four, at eight months post-injection. Uh, we've done quite a bit of study. I'm narrowing down here to the, to the, to the most important uh, point. At eight months post-injection, um, injection one single uh, injection, we could see here expression of, from both nanoparticles, the one with the MOP opsin promoter and the one with the IRPB promoter, a good level of expression seen by green uh, labeling in here, and then the red is uh, cone opsin uh, antibody. We can see expression in both nanoparticles, a bit less with the IRPB promoter because we see patches of area that don't have expression. We also express, uh, see expression from the mutant uh, vectors, while you don't see any expression with the saline. We looked at the RPE of, um, of these injected eye, as you can see again here, in the ABCA4, like saline injected eye, you see the accumulation of lipid droplets in here. In the two injected eye with the nanoparticle, we see significant reduction in the presence of these lipid droplets, and here is a quantification of uh, an, a good number of animals that were tested. We could see about half uh, reduction in, in, in the presence of these uh, nasty materials in the retinal pigment epithelium. We looked at the fundus of these animals, um, and this is another phenotype seen in patient as well as in the model. I don't know if you can see this clearly. We, uh, there are uh, white speckles in the fundus distributed throughout the eye. In comparison here, you don't see them in the wild type. In the two nanoparticle treated eye, we see significant reduction in these, um, in these uh, speckles. A um, little bit more, we see it is still in this area uh, that has not been removed. Uh, from the uh, mutant uh, nanoparticle, we see uh, uh, the speckles are still there. It didn't get corrected. More importantly, we asked this functional um, uh, uh, experiment, we did this functional experiment to see if what we delivered had improved on the recovery of the dark adaptive response in these um, animals. Um, let me see, let me go back. Oh, okay. So as you can see here um, from wild type retina, if you have the animal um, exposed to light and then you put the, in, put the animal in the dark and you ask how long it will take to recover, to recover um, the retina function, it takes about 20, uh, 25 to 26 minutes to get a full recovery. In, in the patients and in this mouse model, it takes really long time and still would not recover, even here at almost about an hour is still not recovered. We see a similar phenomenon with the mouse that were injected with saline. But with the one that injected with the mouse uh, opsin uh, nanoparticle, we could see full recovery um, of, the dark of the dark adaptive response. Uh, and we observed a similar uh, phenomenon with the one with the other nanoparticle. So this was very um, successful outcome that we were very happy with, and now we are trying to enhance the level of expression to be comparable to the wild type um, uh, uh, gene, and also to enhance the distribution for, so we can get 100% rescue 
of the Star Guard phenotype. So next, I would like to move into uh, another study we did, and that is to uh, see what we can do to enhance the level of expression of these nanoparticles. So we realized that most of the time, most of gene therapy take advantage of the cDNA because of the limitation on the size of the vector. So we asked the question, if we include introns in our uh, vector um, construction, would we be able to get high level of expression? And we did this study in the Rhodopsin knockout model. And the reason, because this model has no outer segment, all the rods uh, have no outer segment, and also has no function for the rod. But the cone initially are fine, but then after the degeneration of the rod, because of lack of Rhodopsin, the cones start degenerating. So we constructed two vectors. One has the genomic sequence, which is 5KB of all exons and introns, and uh, directed its expression by the 500 base pair of the mouse opsin promoter, and compare it to the cDNA, um, uh, which is about 1.4 uh, KB. And here's these two vectors. We used, um, again, this vector, the size of this vector is close to 15 KB, while the size of the vector is close to uh, 7.5 KB. So we looked at the level of expression from both nanoparticles of these two vectors. We were able to get level of expression with the cDNA about comparable to almost 40% of the wild type. While from the genomic DNA, we were able to get level of expression is about 60% uh, of the wild type, and all depends on the quality of the injection, because in some cases it reached close to um, well, close to 90% of the wild type. And here's northern blot um, analysis of the injected animals. As you can see here, uh, from um, uh, from the two nanoparticles in here that carry the the cDNA, I cannot see it, carrying the cDNA in here, while these two nanoparticles carrying the genomic DNA, we see very nice level of expression at one month post-injection, as expected with the size that we, we designed. We don't see any expression from the saline or from the uninjected eye, while from the wild tab, we see the normal five uh, messages that Rhodopsin usually gives. We looked at the distribution of the transduce photoreceptor cells in here, and this is a whole mount of the retina from uninjected eye, uh, labeled with rhodopsin antibody, and S-opsin, you see it in green, or rhodopsin with red, you see no red um, uh, presence in this flat mount. In the saline injection, we don't see any expression, and this is from the secondary as a control. While from the cDNA, we do see some expression at this uh, time, which is one month, one month post-injection, we see more expression from the genomic DNA, and this is what, what the wild type uh, would look like. At eight months post-injection, we looked at the cDNA um, uh, expressing nanoparticle. We see no, GFP, uh, no rhodopsin expression at all while from the genomic DNA, we do see um, ex rhodopsin expression, albeit a lot less than what we started with, and no expression you can see the, from the saline. So this is, was very uh, promising uh, results. Then we next looked at the structure of this uh, retina, as uh, look, doing here um, a histological analysis of the retina. You could see from the wild type, you have about 12, 11 to 12 rows of nuclei from the genomic, okay, from the genomic injected eye, we could see very nice uh, preservation of the photoreceptor cells from the cDNA injected eye. We see a couple of rows of nuclei while none from the uninjected eye. And here is quantification of several um, eyes looked at. And here looking at the EM level, we could see some of the eyes have nice packed um, outer segments, um, and some, and here's higher magnification. We don't find anything from the cDNA injected eye. This is from the genomic uh, injected eye. And to confirm, these are um, actually rod 
and not cone. We did immunogold labeling with rhodopsin antibody, and we could see these um, genomic injected eye shows these particles, uh, which is the gold particles in there, and none from the cDNA injected eye, and here's none from the in uninjected eye. We function, in terms of the function, we were able to uh, quite a bit rescue the rod function in here from the genomic, but none from the cDNA. And more importantly, uh, we functioned the cone, we rescued the cone. And here is the cone. We were able to rescue the cone up to eight months post-injection, almost up to 60% of the wild type, while uninjected eye showed none. Um, okay, this is, I, I would like, I, I eliminated this. I have the old, okay. In summary, um, I would like to, um, to present this um, technology as, um, as a good uh, way, as a good uh, strategy to use for, uh, for ocular gene uh, therapy, and we were successful in uh, rescuing a few uh, animal models, uh, phenotype in them, for, um, and then we are continue working on vector engineering, and we found it that it can actually promote um, the level of expression and the long longevity of the expression. And we found genomic sequences work a lot better than the cDNA in enhancing the level of expression. And uh, we showed no toxicity at all. And um, even in baboon eyes, which we recently uh, published. Um, our future um, direction continues to, um, to enhance the level of expression up to the wild type level. And we are um, also interested in, uh, in trying to target these nanoparticles to photoreceptor and RPE cells, and we are going to work closely with Dr. Ziadi to target the particle specifically to photoreceptor cells to enhance level of expression. And um, I will stop here. Maybe we'll, we'll try to have uh, one or two brief questions. Thanks for your presentation. Um, can you speculate on why the uh, CBA promoter activity disappeared with the nanoparticles in time? I'm sorry, what was the question again? You, you comparing the nanoparticles with the CBA promoter and the, and the mouse opsin promoter. The right. CBA promoter, the activity disappeared after, I think it was a month or Four three months. Three months. Four yes. months, yeah. Yes. Uh, why? Uh, I think it, it gets silenced. I, it, it does get silenced. Um, I, do, I don't know why. Um, but for several uh, tissue-specific promoter we used, mm -hmm. it won't get silenced. Uh, CMB gets silenced as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the other question is, um, looking with the cDNA, your photoreceptor cells, outer segments do not recover as well as the genomic. So are you, um, does that mean that there's a sequence in the uh, genomic uh, reduction sequence that will help driving our segment formation, and probably you don't know yet what that uh, is. I think I think that having the intronic sequence enhance the stability of the DNA in in active chromatin structure inside the nucleus and continue expressing for a long period of time. And this we did not test it beyond eight months uh, post injection. It could stay much longer. And in some experiment and other studies, we were able to see it expressing even at 15 days post injection, uh, 15 months post uh, injection in the photoreceptors. So one more question was that the, uh, you know, we know that when you isolate rhodopsin and run it down on a gel, you get the multi-band several, you know, dimeris dimerization, et cetera, in the gel. You didn't see that with any of your uh, yes, constructs? Yes, we did. So, yeah, oh, it, 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 it behaved very similar to the, to the oh, wild okay. type, okay. yeah. It's, it's because we used exactly the same gene, the whole intronic and exonic, so it behaved very, very similar to the wild type. Hello. Elise Lugek de Salut from Joyos Therapeutics in London. Um, thank you for your really interesting talk. I would like to ask you two questions, since you already answered one. Uh, did you ever try to do intravitreal injection to see if you can target photoreceptors and RP? Or does it stay local, as you said, for the subroutine yes. injection? Yes, we did uh, test the efficacy of these nanoparticles from, by delivering it in the vitreous. And as a matter of fact, this uh, paper just 
got published in non-human uh, primates. We used the baboon for this study. We compared uh, delivery in the vitreous versus subretinal, and we found out, of course, subretinal, you always get better expression, but from the vitreous, we also saw, we were able to see some expression, but not as comparable as the intravitreal, uh, as comparable to the subretinal. But right now, we are working on adopting different strategies that we could deliver these particles from the vitreous and target it to go to the photoreceptor cells from the vitreous, and that is going to be our future studies. Okay, thank you. And my second question, you started uh, answering it, but I would like to know what other species did you test with the subretinal injections? So I, sorry, what other species than mice and baboon oh, did you species, test? the yes. species? Yeah. Okay. Um, and for all the studies that we have done, we have our breeder mice, which started almost uh, 25 years ago, a combination between C50, C50 uh, uh, black seven mice with FEB. We, FEB, you know, it has the um, RD mutation, but combine them together and we did several generations. We eliminated the RD phenotype from it, which is PDE mutation. So we have our own breeders, which is a lot of CB, C, uh, C57 black, but it has a better caring for their own pups um, than, than the original C57 black. But we did a study that we published it, uh, also recently where we tested the ability of these nanoparticles in different species of mice. And there are some difference from one species to another to, in terms of their capability to be taken up by, by the cells. And for the bigger species? I'm sorry? For the bigger species? For species that are not rodents or mice? We, like, we uh, tested in, the, we tested in uh, uh, C2J and when biopsy in, uh, in the C57 black that we got it from Jackson. C57 black did not work very well. So um, my question was about the other species, the big one. Oh, the big dogs, species pigs. was baboon. No, we didn't try it for the dog, but we tried it for baboons. Okay, okay thank you. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, I just want to ask you about the DNA. Are you using just regular plasmids? Or are you using mini circles? Or can you tell us a little bit more about uh, that? We tried the mini circles and, um, before, and, and also we tried uh, linear DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't work as good as the plasmid we are using, which is PEP uh, plasmid that was generated by, um, by LIPS uh, uh, group from Germany. So we took that plasmid, we did, we did all the modifications of we modified it quite a bit uh, with the changes that we have. So, but we compared it, uh, our comparison was to regular pocket plasmid uh, that you used in the lab to transfect any mammalian cells. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, we're gonna, we're gonna close up the session now. I think um, we're a bit over. Uh, I wanna thank all four of our speakers for excellent talks. Thank you for coming. Thank you.